Nick, and welcome to the Einstein Forum, virtually or uh, in three dimensions. It's my great pleasure to introduce Shamu Paluri, who is our this year's Einstein Fellow. I'd like to say a word about the Einstein Fellowship for any of you listening who might be interested in applying for next year's fellowship, um, or who might know someone who fits the right description every year, the Einstein Forum, and now together with the Wittgenstein Foundation, sponsors one young person, young we're defining as under 35, it's somewhat arbitrary, but um, at some point we have to have a cutoff date, who has done interesting work in one field, but would like to break out and do something that's as little as possible connected with what he or she has done before. This person receives six months uh, stay in the garden house of Einstein's own <clears throat> house in Kaput, seven kilometers from Potsdam, and has no responsibilities except ha has a fellowship, has plenty to eat, and uh, transportation paid for from Mumbai or uh, Kazakhstan or wherever our various fellows have come from. Um, and they have no responsibilities except to work on that project and to present somewhat near the end of their fellowship the results of their thought and work in Einstein's house. And we've been doing this program now for 13 years. We're very pleased with it. We've, we've hosted some of the most interesting young people from many, many places uh, whom I've ever met. Um, the first Einstein fellow is sitting in the back here, Misha Balovich is our first Einstein fellow, who's now a senior researcher for the Einstein Forum. Um, and we hope thereby to strike a blow against the increasing specialization which young intellectuals are normally subject to. Um, if they want to get any sort of a job, we, uh, we want to reward them for going a bit off the track, which they're usually punished for. So if anyone who's listening to this would like to apply for this year's fellowship, all the information is on our website. Pardon? Excellent. That's so that right, next year's fellowship. Thank you. Yes, we, we already have somebody coming for 22, but we would like to apply for the 23 fellowship. Um, all the information is on our website. Uh, if you know someone who you think might be a good candidate, please tell him or her to apply. Um, this talk was originally scheduled for, was it February 23rd? It's the day before the war, right? 17th. 17th, sorry, it was a week before the war. Um, this talk was originally scheduled for February 17th. And to our great consternation, after my colleague and our board member, Lorraine Daston, had given a quite beautiful introduction, uh, we were in the middle of something like a hurricane and all the power in Kaput went out and Shah had only said about three sentences and was simply cut off. It was um, quite uh, an unhappy situation, made all the more unhappier by the fact that the power outage destroyed most of the files that he had been working on uh, so carefully during this time. Um, and it, thank you, Sean, for reconstructing something. Um, I'm, I'm sure it was a blow. I can't imagine quite uh, how one deals with that kind of a loss. It's really double bad luck. And unfortunately, Lorraine Daston is not here tonight to um, introduce Sean again. But we've decided to play, for those of you who didn't have a chance to see it, we've decided to play her introduction again, because I think it describes Sean Glory uh, 
quite beautifully, quite accurately. So I'm just here as a stand-in for Professor Gaston to say once again how happy we've been, Sean, to host you. Um, you go down uh, in the uh, you know the annals of our very favorite fellows of all time, who brought an awful lot to the Einstein Forum. Uh, I think at least as much as we may have given you. And the best news I've heard from you is that you actually plan to come back at some point to Germany, uh, if not as an Einstein fellow in some other way. So um, I will um, I will turn this over virtually to Lorraine and I will be available for questions after Sean's talk. will be lecturing in his fifth language, um, the extra trouble, especially to Sean. Rainy. Thank you very much, Susan. Welcome to everyone, um, especially to Sean, our lecturer for this evening. And I think to spare Sham, who will be lecturing in his fifth language, um, the extra trouble, I'll read out your questions. Um, Fragen auf Deutsch sind herzlich willkommen. Um, ich übersetze gerne. Um, as you've just heard from Susan, Sham is the 2020 Albert Einstein Fellow of the Einstein Forum. And uh, he not only inhabits Einstein's garden house in Kaput, he inhabits Einstein's audacious spirit. The former fellows who have occupied that house have been an extremely diverse lot from many different parts of the world. But I think it's fair to say that all of their projects were high wire acts. That is, they were acts of intellectual daring the kind of deviation from a straight and narrow career path that prudent, well-intentioned people would probably advise them against, as they advised Albert Einstein to no avail. We're going to be hearing in a few minutes more about Sham in his own words, even his title gestures toward its ambition. But I want to say something first about Sham himself. He is a research associate of the R. N. Podor Institute in Mumbai, India, where he's dedicated himself to science education. He successfully trained his students to participate in international competitions, but probably much more important, he's inspired them with his own curiosity about the foundations of science. In Sham's case, that curiosity has generated a remarkable series of books that he has either edited or co-edited on topics that range from space, time, and the limits of human understanding, which came out in 2017, to on the philosophy of art and science, tango of an internally inseparable duo, which came out in 2019. Now, there are quite a few others, but those titles give you something of the flavor and the breadth of Sham's interests. He asks big questions, the kind of questions most sober scientists and scholars have stopped asking, even if those are precisely the questions that drew them to a life of inquiry in the first place. And yet, Sham has persuaded some of those very sober, very eminent researchers to take up these questions again as contributors to his volumes. I have no idea how he even got through to the likes of Noam Chomsky or Sir Martin Rees and the other luminaries he has recruited, much less convince them to write articles for these collections. But I suspect even having only met Sham Alas in the pallid media of email and Zoom, 
that it has something to do with his own personal intellectual intensity, a kind of radiance that comes through um, even in our current prison of two dimensions. Shams' passion to understand returns us to the beginning of all inquiry. In Aristotle's words, in wonder is the beginning of philosophy. The publishers of Sham's volumes describe them as highly interdisciplinary. That is certainly true, but it is not the whole truth. It would be more accurate to say that they are anti-disciplinary. Sham's projects seek an understanding of the world in its entirety, not just of this or that sliver of the world assigned to physics or biology or psychology or philosophy. And tonight he'll be reporting on that never ending effort to understand the world in the round. His title is From Electrons to Elephants and Elections, A Grand Unified Narrative on Content in Context. Sham, we look forward to hearing you. Oh. Dear friends, um, such strange times. Uh, a short prelude, if I may. Uh, my stay at Einstein House, Kapoot, and the times we are living in can be best characterized uh, by the opening lines of A Tale of Two Cities. Um, My lecture on 17th of February, which started with the generous introduction by Professor Lorraine Daston got disrupted due to the storm and my presentations and the animations, which I have developed over the several months got corrupted. So when I had to reschedule the talk, the biggest challenge was to reconstruct everything from scratch. I have to rely upon the mind's eye of the listener for my new animations to work. And then came the war. I had bouts of terrible cognitive dissonance. How can I speak about my work when the bombs are dropping? This question was a solitary companion to me during the day, escorted by nightmares during the night. Had it not been for the kind encouragement of Susan Lyman, Christina Kaufman, and few others, I would not have mustered the courage and motivation to be here and speak in front of you all. In that sense, I'm extremely grateful to them and to the other lovely people at Einstein Forum and to the people at Kaputh who visited me here. Coming from the chaotic city of Mumbai, my stay at Einstein House and the long solitary walks I took in the forest made me experience things that I cannot put into words. And I tried hard to pick up some of the aspects that may have relevance to the present scenario and that may be of use to some of the listeners. I'm now trying to put forth a groundbreaking theory and very much being very much aware of the islands of, uh, that language games can place us in furthering separation and giving us an illusion of knowledge, I decided that I would speak from my experience alone. Moreover, given the people listening to my talk and their own intellectual stature, I can easily read off a theorem that the epistemic content of this room remains conserved. And in that sense, this talk is more of a reminder to my own self. In any case, um, these are the two books that resulted from my Einstein Fellowship. So this talk is not directly connected to my books. I would speak about the notion of interrelationships, which has family resemblance to my books, to borrow a Wittgenstein's phrase. Um, setting the context. When I was very young, FM radios were in great demand. Unaware of the electromagnetic waves, I always thought there is some tiny man living inside the radio and is speaking childish analog of now homunculus theory of mind. When my parents were not around, I finally ripped off the radio to only find circuits, magnets, screws, and bolts. While curiosity led me halfway, I could not holistically reassemble the radio into a functioning unit. Thereafter, I could only play with magnets and make shapes with aluminum wires, none of which could replace the original beauty of the radio. This was my shocking experience with aim aimless, freely floating curiosity. Many years later, I wonder if our scientific 
and philosophical endeavors and curiosity belong to this kind. With, with the goal and curiosity to understand cosmos, we may rip it apart to the level of nuts and bolts. We can still play with them and make good technology and so on. But can we reassemble our notions of cosmos to preserve the original holistic interconnections? Can we still enjoy the beauty of lakes and mountains without damaging them? These questions kept coming back, not as a way to dampen my curiosity, but to re-examine the outlook I have towards the existence. I began to get a glimpse of the notions of interconnectionness, which concerns the topic of today's talk. As I was preparing this presentation, not belonging to academia, nature has been the only sounding board for my ideas and thoughts. Can I stand before a lake or in the midst of a dense forest and present to them the things I would present to my fellow humans? My words started to stop, drop dead. What could I say looking at a blossoming flower? Words and thoughts felt incomplete. I could see the pretense and all sorts of hidden things in my attempts to speak. And silence alone is the way out. When my teacher told the class to be silent, I thought she did not want us to speak. But now I realized silence is speaking fully with all our being, just without words and conceptual construction. And amidst that moment, I took this vow. When I speak, I try to not bear the pretense to inquire about those aspects in science and philosophy that I don't otherwise inquire in the depths of my heart. I try my best to keep my heart and mind together. Interestingly, in Chinese language, the character for heart and mind is the same, Shin, dubbed as heart-mind. Emotion and reason were not considered as separate, but rather as co-extensive. Co Shin is as much cognitive as emotional, being simultaneously associated with thought and feeling. This already sets some stage to discuss the interconnectionness between things. Since the dawn of Greek civilization, man has been trying to categorize and analyze things. Divide and conquer works swiftly. It has led to numerous successes and opened up a space of possibilities. But the diverse and div reductionist attitude brought about its own share of disasters. As I saw the way of birds and trees in the forest, I understood how much I remain separated from nature due to the dualistic way of thinking. Man and nature, I read again and again in all books. Why should there be this divide? Social ontology gives us an invisible framework for being mostly involuntary. A bird or an insect has to constantly be connected to the environment when it is in the open street. But when I walk on the sideway, I walk in a way as if there is an invisible web protecting me around. I know that it's improbable that cars would dash into me or planes would crash into me. While, give, while this gives me a sense of security, it also slowly disconnects me from the nature. When was the last time we looked at the sky? I asked myself. It seems that the notion of sky is surgically removed from our ontology, at least in India. While I would say that I walked on the street, I would not say I pumped the blood. I divide things into voluntary and involuntary, man and woman, passive and active, living and non-living. While such categories can come handy, what are the large scale ramifications of such endless divisions? While I can swim in a river and walk away, how can I understand its fears? I can only think about the death of a river by being a river, death of a planet by being a planet. Only in these recent years are we increasingly speaking about ecology and interconnected nature of things. Things are interconnected. While our agricultural experts are aware of the connection between cherry blossoms and honey bees, the interconnections I'm going to present here, which is borrowed from an Eastern test, which is more than thousand years old goes far beyond this. While, this. while an idea of this sort can be termed as mystical, it is not completely alien to the West. Thinkers like Whitehead and others realized the untenability of 
good old distinctions between subject and object, human and nature, space and time under objective inquiry. Starting with Descartes, the anthropocentric view exchange between conscious mind and mechanistic body or mind and dead matter trickled down through the scientific and philosophical allies in one way or the other. The way science was taught to me from childhood was that it alone represents an objective, true narrative of things. Well, after I learned more, I realized this may not be the view all scientists and philosophers of science hold. But this is certainly the view that has percolated deeply into the mass consciousness. Some even take it far too ahead, termed as scientism or positivism, with a claim that one day we might, using the scientific method, be able to explain how we have elephants from electrons, presidents from protons, and civilizations from cells in a linear hierarchical fashion. Um, shows that um, things were a little bit like that way. In other words, um, think a view like scientism or positivism roughly states that every question either has a scientific solution or none at all. Thereby, all other disciplines, be it humanities or philosophy or arts, to sustain, have to succumb and imitate the scientific method by viewing their methodologies under an objective scientific lens giving up their own uniqueness and producing literature full of pseudo-scientific jargon. Sad it is, as Wittgenstein once remarked in Culture and Value, people nowadays think that scientists exist to instruct them, poets, musicians, etc., to give them pleasure. The idea that these have something to teach them, that does not occur to them. I'm not saying that the theory of evolution is wrong, nor I'm saying that the pursuit of scientific method has to be given up. All I realized was things are not as clean and as neat as they look. There are numerous assumptions, heuristics, beliefs, approximations, and even leaps of faith that lurk as elephants in the room of scientific method. We must not close our mind fully so that we suffocate inside. And so we must keep our mind open, but at the same time also not so open that our minds fall out. Both science and language proceed as if our words, concepts, and attitudes depict a world independent of us. And there may be an evolutionary advantage to this. A deer should not construe the chasing tiger as a constructed category. We must not forget the ways in which the categories of language slice the world which we experience and represent it in an intercausal, intersubjective manner. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that language creates reality. I'm saying otherwise. What we consider as reality is the matter of our cognitive and linguistic categories. Each word we utter is a part of language game and has a specific context and an action associated with it. It is often not feasible to recount the infinite in instantiations of entities around us. So we bag all of those into general categories and use words and notions to organize our experience and sail through the ever-changing world. Of course, any such inclusive system should abstract away a lot of specific features of what it represents for the very sense-making to take place. While universals are useful and chased after, we are aware of the problems that arise when we define a concrete thingness of an object, be it a bottle or a human or a mathematical construct. Is a bottle without a cap still a bottle? What about a human qua? Feather, featherless biped without a leg. 
We can construct all sorts of ling linguistic gymnastics like a knife without a blade and whose handle is lost to a number five being defined as a set of five objects not included in that set. At what point something ceases to exist cannot be re readily read off, but it's a matter of our social linguistic and cultural categories. Same is true of the seemingly eternal fixated categories like goodness, evil, and so on. While we mistake a harmless rope for a snake in the dark, the same harmless rope can be harmful when it is around a trap on the ground. Boundaries of, of, of objects are fluid. Ignoring this, when our words take a life of their own, our delusion begins. Our words and scientific concepts cannot go far away from the center of normative gravity. In linguistic or scientific parlance, the demarcated entities co-arise with human intentions and purposes. There is these, there's a reason why we don't group sun and earth together as one. And such purposes are obscured when one chases after the literal truth that can never be attained. Now, towards the end of 15th century, various thinkers were trying to recover the original language of Adam which would then enable them to have a direct access to reality. But a failure to do so combined with rationality led them to other languages, for instance, the language of mathematics and science. In the East, people dealt with pluralistic and often contradictory narratives in a different way. There were Vedic thinkers who thought Sanskrit does this job perfectly and gave words realistic import. Or thinkers from other schools, including Buddhism, who akin to Wittgenstein, thought words never refer to extra linguistic entities. And this relativism did not lead to logical and ethical singularities as one might surmise. Nor did, did they abandon the language in search of a better one. Rather, by awakening our hearts to interconnected nature of language, one can refine it to deliver the needed soteriological dose. It is because words don't refer to anything static, one can employ them skillfully upaya, as they call in Sanskrit, in logic, life, and also in love. So following this, ancient Indians did not have an issue in admitting pluralistic narratives of the world, for instance, on the origin of the cosmos. Each narrative is meant to achieve a specific goal, and if it does not overstep the boundaries, one can play language games peacefully without any conflict. I would like to provide an example of the same. Here is a milestone before one enters a town called Velur in the south of India. This milestone indicates 55 meters. As you can see, the indigenous people decorated it, offered coconuts and flowers to it. It was a remnant of the ancient belief that outskirts of the town are guarded by local deity. And these deities provided the empirical input to the metric, so to speak, and the notion of space is thereby reconstructed around it. Perhaps a very different application of Whitehead's method of extensive abstraction. We surely cannot predict the nature of gravity or derive Einstein's field equations from such a conception, but my friend who is doing masters in physics has no issue when the modern notion of space coexists with the ancient notion of space in his mind. They, they don't mean to contradict each other, but such binary opposites indeed foster meaning. The opposites derive meaning from one another. To summarize, I wanted to outline how our concepts and narratives actively construct the world and how various narratives can coexist without contradicting each other, but silently carrying out their designated tasks. The need of the hour is to have a worldview that is grounded in science, but at the same time, a worldview which does not deny the richness of human experience and other valid ways of knowing apart from science. The nature of language and interconnected nature of reality can allow us to do so. I will now put forth one such view, which can almost look psychedelic, but I firmly believe the positive outlook such a view can engender. With constantly expanding boundaries, modern science along with ecology is learning more on the implicate and explicate order of being propounded by the not notable physicist David Baum. So here he speaks a little bit about the implicate and explicate order and how implicate is a little bit subtle and explicate is, becomes explicit to our observation. But um, 
While we can construe our physical laws to govern the bits of matter bumping into each other, implicate our order does not uh, disappear, but it goes far beyond this. Quantum mechanics, along with the notion of non-locality, can be a useful metaphor here. Universe is not a dead backstage on which the actors perform, but is actively participating, giving itself and our way of creation the needed meaning. Whole interpenetrates into parts and vice versa. Not only the, does the whole arise from parts, our very concepts of space and time can originate from meta concepts hinting at the implicate order of things and the important importance of openness. Here is one such model that might depict the emergence of space. There are many competing models, but I selected this model, not because it's scientifically perfect, but it can be visually depicted. While the explicate order of things can be made intelligible through abstractions, the underlying implicate order continues to exist. This model employs the space as a network of grains and the distance and energy, roughly speaking, as function of hops between the nodes. In the beginning was a dense cluster where every node is connected to every other node and can be reached in a single hop. The notions of nearness and farness did not exist. So we can go from Potsdam to Kaput and also from Potsdam to Eastern China in a single hop. But as we see, this is not really possible in the three dimensions. So we have points here that can be reached in a single hop, for instance. And these are three points that can be reached uh, in a single hop again. And that's the fourth point, if you assume in, a, in four dimensions. But what happens if you have a fifth point? So this notion of having a single hop to jump between two grains of space cannot be visualized on a um, everyday um, 2D or 3D Euclidean space. So this was a proto space, something that gave birth to a space. So according to the theory, um, the, this was the state of the universe it was in in the beginning, but you can also see that this also does not represent really uh, the state. It's a two dimensional projection of the beginning state of the universe. You can clearly see some nodes are closer and some nodes are far. And this is a sort of a hyperbolic space. So, uh, but this is a visualization. But um, we, can, we can also represent it with our um, mind's eye, but it's really tough to visualize that each node is connected to every other node using a single hop. But the theory is that there are no hierarchies here. Every node is connected to every other node and space exists as it is right now. And there is no farther or closer also here because everything can be reached in one hop. And now we, I would like to share how the space originates. And uh, this model that is uh, created by very reputed scientists, they show from such a space how the normal notion of space originates. So imagine six grains of space here. They're all equidistant and they can be reached through single hop. You can see that this is how it might look. And as the universe cooled down, the energy dissipated and some links got erased. So this then neatly settles down into a lattice, which is the humdrum 3D world. You can see here that it's, it's back to the normal world. Uh, for instance, to reach from this point to this point, uh, we no longer can reach it through single hop, but we have to traverse many intermediate points. So these two points are distant compared to these two. It's a normal space. Now assume that during the energy, energy transitions, energy is not completely lost and there are some links that are still existing, a glitch that left its signature, like the cool eyes that has a lattice defect. For instance, this is the so-called alien link. So when things cool down and we obtain the space, these long links, as named by Brian Swingle, or disordered locality by Lee Smolin exist and can be considered as wormholes and entanglement and action at distance then becomes easy to grasp. A classical notion between A and B, or the notion of the space, can be reached that way, but we should not forget that link as well. There's always a link that connects this point of the space to the, that point of the space. So, 
As we have seen, the implicate order tends to show up explicitly when we take the implicate order is obscured by the representation of the world, we cannot fully make sense of what is happening. There's an analog to this in phenomenology, the notion of openness and horizon of the perceptual focal grid. When we perceive objects arranged spatio-temporally, we usually tend to the delimited forms of them. But indeed, these objects are always perceived within a field. With what is termed as noetic shift, we can shuttle between foreground and background in a way whether neither foreground stands out nor background fades away. This marks the beginning of insight into the nature of things, or pragna, as they call in Sanskrit. This foreground and background proportion is often studied in art. In the East, attention is given towards the openness and details of other objects are added to only make this openness more visible. Western portrait art, at least till the age of romanticism, portrayed things other way around. When the rigid boundaries and demarcations can be made transparent, we enter into a realm of openness where the field and objects situated in it neither dominate nor obstruct each other. As Merleau-Ponty notes, to see is to enter a universe of beings which display themselves. To look at an object is to inhabit it. And from this habituation, grasp all things in terms of the aspect which they present to, to it. Thus, every object is the mirror of all others. Now let me turn towards the final conclusion of this talk, the intricate interconnected of, <coughs> interconnectedness of things as depicted by the jewel net of Indra. So this is a, this Buddhist system of philosophy called Hawaiian philosophy appears in the written form in China and has five patriarchs. So this is the infinite mirroring and the net of Indra. Far away in the heavenly abode of the great God Indra, there's a wonderful net which has been hung by some cunning artificer in such a manner that it stretches out infinitely in all directions. In accordance with the extravagant taste of the deities, the artificer has hung a single glittering jewel in each eye of the net. And since the net itself is infinite in dimension, the jewels are infinite in number. There hang the jewels glittering like stars in the first magnitude, a wonderful sight to behold. If we now arbitrarily select one of these jewels for inspection and look closely at it, we will discover that in its polished surface, there are reflected all the other jewels in the net, infinite in number. Not only that, but each of these jewels reflected in this one jewel is also reflecting all other jewels so that there is an infinite reflecting process occurring. Providing a visually appealing view of existence, this school symbolizes a cosmos where there is an infinitely repeated interrelationships between the parts. Each part interpenetrates into the other part. Whole and parts interpenetrate into each other as well. This may look crazy. Unexpected feedback loops are not fully alien to modern science. Overusing an air conditioner may contribute to rising sea levels via melting of the glaciers. Saving loads of data online may contribute to global warming. And maybe the appearance of life and organic matter settling on the down of the seafloor has lubricating effect in the subducting plate, furthering the continental drift. Universe in this sense does not behave as a background, but as one being where everything affects everything else. This view needs further elaboration. Let's take today's event as an example. For this event to take place, there are lit literally millions of supporting causal factors from the fact that the ground we are standing on is stable and thereby the electrons obey Pauli's exclusion principle to the fact that Susan's parents met each other and my parents met each other. Susan's taxi driver did not run into someone else. His eyes are working well which means the food he ate is not poison and is cooked well. The farmers are producing food well, rain and sunshine with led, which led to the growth of the crops and so on. If we carefully meditate, it seems as if the entire universe is present in this event. This fact became very evident to me in my childhood when there was an outbreak of conjunctivitis. Everyone in the school were lined up to receive an antibiotic eye drops and our bus driver was standing there in the line as well. 
Some teachers complain that they receive it first and that drivers and support staff have to receive it later. Later that evening, being on the bus with 100 other people, I realized my survival dependent is dependent upon the rods and cones of the eye of the driver. And so is the case with the teacher who complained earlier and now who is traveling on the same bus. We can choose to ignore the field and background and focus on discrete objects and go on a quest to discover the effective causal factors. Upon deep investigation, we arrive at least in Hua and Buddhism that there, are, there is no causal center or causal primary. Even if there is such a center, it's everywhere. We understand the notion of dependence. I depend on my food for my survival and I need sunlight, water, and so on. But Hawaiian Buddhism propounds, as we have seen earlier, that things interpenetrate. What is this interpenetration? How is this dip different from interdependence? Interpenetration is a, an implicate order of things that manifests as interdependence, its explicate order. Interpenetration concerns the very relationships, whereas the interdependence concerns the objects in it. To understand better, we need to understand the notion of emptiness. Emptiness can be misunderstood as nothingness or denying of things, and this thereby led people like Nietzsche to misunderstand Buddhism, who once called as who once called Buddhism as life-denying pessimism. Emptiness or shunyata in Sanskrit refers to the intricate inter interdependence of things. I like the term interbeing coined by the Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh to the word in emptiness. Buddhism says things are empty. This does not mean that they don't exist. Glass is empty, means it has no liquid in it, but it does not mean that there is no air in it. We need to ask, things are empty of what? And Buddhism says, empty of an independently existing self. While conventionally things can be designated using our words and notions, in an absolute sense, their boundaries dissolve and they inter are. If I, if I were to ask myself, who am I? I cannot point to a single organ of my body or a process and say, this is me. In a sense, everything that constitutes me is me. I'm a locus of interrelationships, which possess what is called a pattern integrity. Self is merely a placeholder, and I like, I like to see it as Herman Weil's beautiful conception. Thus, gravitational field enters into the proposition as a contingent factor, and moreover, there enters into it an individual exhibited point on which we lay the finger by a demonstrative act as is expressed in the words like I, here, now, and this. Such a de demonstrative act, self is such a demonstrative act, although a subtle one. And we all learned such demonstrative acts of pointing with fingers when we practice saying our names in childhood. The main objective behind all of this is soteriological rather than metaphysical. Attachment to self is the source of suffering. One school does not deny the self. It only says that self is made up of non-self elements. The difference can be illustrated with an example of silence. Silence can be construed as absence of speaking, but if you ask a lover drunk in poetry, they might say silence is not an absence of speaking. It is speaking fully, but with no words. Also, our skin can be considered as a separating boundary, or the very point of contact with the world. Similarly, emptiness does not mean nothing. It means one with everything. Now let's return to the interpenetration. So I, we can speak here a little bit about the nature of the words, uh, which is simple in, in our vocabulary. So you have words like Gandhi, and words by itself do not mean anything. It has to be connected into a net of other words. So you have other words here. And um, if you take all such words, they are connected to each other. And what is a word is defined by its set of relationships it holds to the other words. So here there's a word that is linked to B, C, and D. And each of those words indeed is linked to every other word. So if you construct a sufficiently rich semantic web, you can clearly see that every word in that web can be hopped down to every other word. It's like the universe that we saw in the beginning. Every word is some way, uh, there's a path that connects to the every other word because they are all connect interconnected. And now you have all these words, but words on their own mean nothing. So you need to have a function 
which takes words and generates the meaning. That can be a language game, it can be its pragmatic use, and there are many types of theories of meaning. But um, here is an abstract uh, notion of meaning here. And now the important question is to ask, does meaning fall in the same category as words? But for now, we, we can represent it with a different color. And now we can see that um, meaning is a function of words and words are a function of meaning. They arise mutually. Suppose let's take this example. Bachelor is an unmarried man. This sentence is studied widely in analytic philosophy as uh, analytic uh, and synthetic division. So if we take this sentence, bachelor is an unmarried man, bachelor and unmarried man, the words, they are linked to each other. Not only this, to define the unmarried man again, you need the notion of bachelor again. So what is happening here is that there are certain words that include the other words in their ontology. So if you take a tree, these are the trees um, uh, as called in logic, any word includes the other words inside of the tree. And it, it is a mirroring process that keeps happening over and over again. So you see this can continue on and on, on and on. So here, one of the ontological remarks that I can make is that some trees include the other tree and which include indeed the first tree to begin with. So things are causally and symmetrically interpenetrating into each other. And now we can see there is meaning there and meaning also interpenetrates into the words. So what is happening here is that there are, um, to, to illustrate an example here, let's take the mathematical notion of a clean bottle here. We can see how things interpenetrate onto each other though they are being the same. So this is an example of a clean bottle. And as you can see, an ant can crawl without leaving the surface inside and outside. And there was a good animation for this that I made, but which got lost. So I had to rely upon this. So you can visualize words and everyday objects as being this. They interpenetrate into each other, they come into each other, and then they again come into each other and so on. So this is an infinite mirroring process that is happening. Every part interpenetrates every other part. Every whole penetrates its parts and parts interpenetrate the whole. There's a seamless, non-obstructive flow. Nothing is denied, nothing is explained away. Emptiness is not a view or a concrete attribute. It is the nature of existence. And is emptiness independent of other things? No, emptiness itself needs objects. So emptiness itself is empty. Emptiness of emptiness, as they say. The bread I'm eating may contain the whole cosmos in it. There's wheat, water, sunlight, farmer, and so on. You may ask, if not for this farmer, another farmer can produce the wheat, but then I won't be eating the same bread I'm eating. When one part is removed or replaced, the cosmos won't vanish, but this won't be the same cosmos we are talking about. From the viewpoint of the grain of the wheat, it looks like it has a central causal power to produce the tree. Well, even if sunlight, water, and everything else is present, without the grain, the plant is not produced, my student once intelligently remarked. Yes, that may be so. It may look like grain is the effective cause, but from the viewpoint of the sun, it looks exactly the same. Rest of all factors can be present, but if sunlight is missing, the plant does not come. The confusion arises because we think causality is linear and unidirectional. Causality is multidirectional in Hawaiian Buddhism and is a continuum. What is seen as a cause from one side is an effect when viewed from the other side. In this sense, everything is causing everything else and it is in turn being caused by them. This applies to time as well. One must note that the interpenetration does not mean a process of universal homogenization where we exhaust all objects and their identities. While every object contains every other object, it still retains its place in the place value in the tree depicted above. Two words are at two different nodes. And when we depict wheat, grain, and the sun, they too remain at different nodes. So an enlightened being, like a two-headed Janus figure, can look at both the conventional and absolute realms together at once. He understands 
the limited nature of things and at the same time understands their openness. Without friction, he moves around the samsara freely. I will depict this with another rough analogy from a school theorem and show two quotes. We will then proceed to the conclusion. So this is a very simple theorem. And when um, we were discussing this, I quickly realized how um, things can be viewed at two different ways without contradicting each other. So um, what I might do here is that um, I have a um, circle here and I then have a polygon, which is a triangle in this sense. And this is a simple theorem that says then that um, So it, it, it clearly says that um, the angle here is, oops, the, the angle is not working here. So, um, so this theorem here says that the angle here remains constant, which is the alpha here. You move around in the circle. This is very simple to prove. Uh, you can you can you can draw the radii and show that it's an isosceles triangle, and you can clearly infer that the angle remain there constant. So you can see that the angle is remaining constant while the other angles are changing. But when it goes down, it suddenly changes, and uh, of course because you have to subtract it from 180 degrees. But looking at this, we might think that there is some sort of a um, mystical jump here or a singularity here that uh, angle jumps from there of course theorems of uh, mathematics and axioms do speak why it is the case but then what i did once was to just try uh looking at this that um you you take and now here you have So what you have now is that hmm, earlier I had an animation. I'm sorry that um, it is not working now. Um, As you can see here now, that if I if I move around this point, what is happening is that these lines are remaining exactly the same. There's nothing happening to them really. But inside the circle, it looks like the angle is jumping, but the stability of these lines are remaining exactly the same. So, coming back, to this uh, two-headed Janus figure, we can construe things both as um, inside the circle and outside the circle. We, we, we look at the things inside the circle and it looks like things are happening and there's a jump bit in the angle. Or when you zoom out, you see that these are just the lines that are extended and we are just moving around the circle. So looking at this, this is a paragraph from one of the first patriarch of this school. Uh, what he says here is the Lee, the law of, that extends everywhere, has no boundaries or limitations, but she, the objects that are embraced by Lee, have limitations and boundaries. In each and every she, the Lee spreads all over without omission or deficiency. Why? Because the truth of Lee is indiv indivisible. Thus, each and every minute atom absorbs and embraces the infinite truth of Lee in a perfect and complete manner. She, the matter that embraces, has boundaries and limitations. And Li, the truth that is embraced by things, has no boundaries or limitations. Yet, this limited she is completely identical, not partially identical with Li. Why? Because she has no substance, 
it is the self same lee therefore without causing the slightest damage to itself an atom can embrace the whole universe if one atom is so all other dharmas should be so contemplate on this and there is an another interesting uh, quote here because they have no self food the large and small can mutually contain each other since the very small is very large mountain sumeru is contained in mustard seed and since the very large is the very small the ocean is included in a hair while these are good analogies actual things can only be seen when we step into as david bomb puts it uh, a higher dimension these things cannot be grasped conceptually one has to see them for oneself through the meditative awareness the conclusion here would be that the attitudes of our mind have a strong role in shaping the world as we have seen earlier mind can transform not just the world but our own bodies as sta- studied in placebo effects while scientific progress and rationality weeded out dangerous superstitions and religious idols that harm us inadvertently they played with certain aspects of our unconscious as carl jung says a scientific understanding has grown so our world has become dehumanized man feels himself isolated in the cosmos because he is no longer involved in the nature and has lost his emotional unconscious identity with the natural phenomena these have slowly lost their symbolic implication thunder is no longer the voice of an angry god nor is lightning his avenging missile no river contains a spirit no tree is the life principle of a man no snake is the embodiment of wisdom no mountain cave the home of a great demon no voices now speak to the man from stones plants and animals nor does he speak to them believing they can hear his contact with nature has gone and with it has gone the profound emotional energy that this symbolic connection supply i would like to stress the subtle interconnections between mind and the world and unconscious and conscious mind though mind with all its ability gives us a false impression of autonomy and independence there are more things in heaven and earth horatio than that are dreamt in philosophy as shakespeare remarked Our ancestors and certain tribes still today believe in the idea of a unified body and soul. They believe that a unified whole contains the sum of total, the sum total of all experiences, emotions, ways of life that our ancestors collectively experienced. This unified body contains all information necessary for our survival and for our ways of world making. This comes very close to the theory of archetypes. our biological and genetic composition only supports such an idea on the physical scale we are made up of diverse life forms our body contains as many bacterial cells and those pertaining to other organisms as it contains its own cells with its own dna and going down if we do math we inhale thousands of molecules which were once exhaled by socrates and perhaps those of hitler too our minds are constantly processing inputs from the environment and thanks to evolution of mirror neurons we recreate in a drama from an external environment far more easily not only do we water the seeds of anger within us when we see others tightening their fist but when we just tighten our fist for no reason our brain retrocausally infers and searches for a cause for the non existing anger and then projects onto it onto the world as study shows and when we smile for no reason similarly our brain again retrocausally searches for the source of happiness and infers it must be the world outside when we analyze deeply what one calls the world is one's own footprint and for most of the time when we speak about the suffering of others we are referring to our own notions of suffering and hence this prevents us from understanding others and acting effectively we have to be mindful of our own ways of world making consumed with anger and suffering world is an ugly place bathed in happiness world is a lovely place but aha the same world as we have seen in the net of indra not only are we intricately connected to others we are deeply connected to our unconscious which remains hidden but which continues to act silently the aspects which pertain to our unconscious and which escape our attention will then manifest as fate and happenings in the external world therefore each thought we produce each word we speak and every action we perform bears our signature both in the repository of unconscious and also in the world 
His is a wonderful code, all things near and far, hiddenly, to each other linked are. That thou canst not steer a flower without troubling a star. Since we are deeply interconnected and being jewels reflecting each other, sadness in someone far away manifests as sadness in, in us one way or the other. Throughout the day, we continually pick up tons of behavioral and nonverbal cues from the environment, and they slowly shape our unconscious, and for most of the part, their impact remains unknown until they reach the threshold and manifest as headaches and sadness, which we think is coming out of nowhere. Our smile, our pout, gets amplified through the collective perceptual field and butterflies wing fla flap causing tsunami elsewhere appears at a phenomenological level too. Living in the net of Indra, we never lose the sight of interconnectedness. We slowly see that the divide between subject and object, inanimate and animate, mind and body are conventional. And so is this divide between thought, word and deed. However hard we may try, we, we can never place our finger and mark the boundaries between them. Things interpenetrate and everything leaves a participatory trail. Nouns are dead abstractions. Things are in flux. In this sense, not only Susan is sharing this session, but the chair she's sitting on is also chairing in the process of my perception. Subject and object interpenetrate, creating each other in a non-abstracted manner. Since things interpenetrate and need each other, we don't discard the conventional humdrum world in the search of an absolute heaven. For such a heaven is also interdependent upon the humdrum world and derives its meaning from it. Living in the net of Indra is to remain open to this interconnectedness. Living in the net of Indra, we can see the sun, clouds, rivers at our sink in the water we use to wash our dishes. With such awareness, each act becomes miraculous. Each act can be carried out as a right. We develop an intimate relationship with our environment and we preserve gratitude and compassion in our heart. Living in the net of Indra, we see how much the happiness of the world depends upon our, our own happiness. And peace in oneself is peace in the world. As Fazang and other Zen masters indicated, wave lives the life of the waves and also the life of ocean. When we breathe, we breathe for all. Living in the net of Indra is to see this interconnectedness. We are not in it, we are it. Thank you very much for your attention. Sean, that was a tour de force. Uh, I am, as always, quite astonished by the breadth of your knowledge and your ability to make connections between things. Of course, if you believe that everything is connected, then I suppose it's less of a surprise. Um, let me also say to those of you who are watching this virtually, you are welcome to uh, ask any question you would like. Um, please put it in the F&A or Q&A function, and I will read your questions to Sham. Um, but let me start by asking if there are any questions in the room. Thank you. Dominic, please. Just gathering my thought for a second. Um, so when I first met you, you were just you described to me how different it was living in Mumbai versus living in Kaput and it was actually too quiet for you couldn't sleep the silence was deafening um did it take living in a solitary environment to try to write a theory of interconnectedness um could you have come up with the same view of the world in Mumbai? Uh, 
Um, that's a great question. Um, I, I think I would not have come up with um, this notion um, when, I, when I'm in Mumbai. And uh, this can only happen in isolation, but also there is a danger in isolation. Every day we um, um, consume so much. Uh, we not only consume um, the food that we eat, which we are very careful, we, we check the tax like non-GMO and vegan and gluten-free, but we also consume a lot of information, conversations and so on and so forth. But the other ones that we consume are extremely dangerous. For instance, if I don't like a, like a piece of food, I can puke it out. But uh, when I look at a name of something written like classic here, it just zips into my brain and travels at the speed of light and I don't know where it has gone. So every day we are consuming this, but we have no idea of where they are going. So complete silence in Kaput um, made all these things come out as a combinatorial explosion. And it can be pretty dangerous as well, because um, such as um, we have seen there in one of the slides, um, um, this was exactly um, true. So uh, sometimes I sit quietly listening to the sound of falling leaves. Peaceful indeed is life of monk cut, all, cut off from all the worldly matters. Uh, then why do I shed these tears? So, so what happens is that in this complete silence, uh, the notions that we have suppressed in us from such a long time, they start to come up one, one after the other. Then I used to wonder that everything is wonderful here so far. Then why am I getting all these things uh, from nowhere? And then I started to realize this is how uh, the mind functions and uh, Kaput has provided me the perfect opportunity uh, to completely silence the um, input and the stimuli to it so that I can examine the already existing notions in the mind. And uh, in, in the walks of the forest, when our mind is completely still, you, you can not only analytically and theoretically see what I said, you can actually see this. And uh, a lot of people even, including the Western philosophers have, have witnessed this when uh, you go to the level of the uh, perceptual datum itself. And there, at that level, you don't see the boundaries of things anymore. You don't mark a tree as tree or a leaf as a leaf. Things are the way they are, and you can see this awareness. And that may last for a very sh short uh, time. I don't know why people try drugs and alcohol. They should just try walking in the forest. That will give them this exact revelation uh, on a side note. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, this may be a very small um, um, uh, for a short moment of time, but um, um, once you see this, uh, it, it's enough. You can go back and always remember that and then uh, focus on uh, um, making this stay in your mind for a longer time. Just a really quick follow-up question. I mean, uh, I've never tried them myself, but you probably are aware that psychedelics and microdosing have become extremely popular and I wonder if it's if it's a way to get into the kind of headspace to see things as completely illuminated and interconnected as a as an antidote to a sense of social isol isolation or just inability to connect with other people in general. Let me follow uh, up yeah. on that Dominic because I was thinking exactly the same thing. I have tried a bit although it's been a while um, and it's not true shop that anybody walking in the forest will have these kinds of beliefs or sensations. It's just not. I like walking in the forest. I like walking by the seaside. I feel uh, I feel good. I sometimes can even feel a sense of I don't know sublimity. Um, you know, on days where I'm really lucky if it's a really dramatic kind of landscape, I do not feel in the kinds of things that you're describing, but I and other people have, um, you know, described those experiences with um, with psychedelics. So the question is, um, I mean, I'm following up on on Dominic's question. Um, what is it about those substances? that do, and there's now a lot of science on the subject, that do bring about those kinds of states. And what's your secret for just walking in the forest and having that sense of interconnectedness? Because it doesn't have to be. Um, 
That's a wonderful question. And uh, um, when I said that um, walking in the forest, I meant that um, suppose we have a dog and uh, we can take, our, take the dog with us to walk in the forest, but sometimes we leave the dog at home and we walk alone. So when I walk in the forest, I also leave a me at the back, the notion of the self at the back. So this was, uh, um, what can I call, um, a subtle text or a disclaimer that I should have mentioned. It's, uh, you are absolutely right that uh, anyone walking randomly in the forest cannot experience this. But when we uh, slowly dissolve, uh, the subject and object, the awareness between it, when they start to blend in, and when this uh, boundary between both of those interfuse, uh, then we can start to see it completely naturally. Now, coming back to the psychopharmacology, which is a st uh, field that is um, used to study the effects of drugs on our psychology, um, um, I have a couple of friends. I never tried any of it. I don't even drink coffee, so I don't know what sort of phenomenological experiences one gets out of it. But I have uh, some friends who say that uh, they experience nirvana with uh, some um, some um, LSD or DMT or amphetamine or other sort of drugs. Uh, so, but when you study these molecular structures of these, um, um, my my um, my. The only difference between what you can experience in the forest and what you can experience here is that, um, in a sense, walking in the forest is more normal. Uh, and these experiences also come up with a lot of side effects that are really, really, they, they, they don't wane out over periods of time. For instance, uh, the molecules can com uh, completely interlock and uh, stay connected. That way, they rechange the neural pathways. And uh, it, it further leads to other sorts of uh, uh, side effects of uh, taking such thing. So the people can try, and there are, I think, uh, uh, limited and uh, controlled case studies of the use of cannabis in some sort of uh, Alzheimer's and ADHD and so on and so forth. But uh, my, my only thought, and this I may be completely uh, foolish here, because as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, that I don't know anything more than any one of you or not even close to any one of you. Uh, but my only thought is that if you can do this uh, completely natural from... Uh, just starting with the thought and analysis of the thought or meditating upon the thought, uh, why require uh, some substances that can also harm us uh, potentially? Um, well, I would disagree with you again because I think you do understand some things that many of the rest of us don't. Um, and you understand them in a, a, an intuitive way. I've mm -hmm. seen this happen a few times with you, but Martin had a question. I have a, another look at it. Let's give Martin a chance. I'm not getting into drugs now. <laughs> Let's just move on a little bit. I have to admit that your talk, uh, my head is spinning. Yeah. <laughs> my head is spinning. I can't, can't actually piece it all together. Maybe I shouldn't. Even the words piecing things together are probably mm -hmm. wrong, uh, considering what you said. But still, I want to try at least to understand some of your basic distinctions a little better than I do now, because there were so many of them that, um, I, as I said, I haven't got my head around it yet. In particular, I would like to, you to say something more about the difference between three, what I thought was, were basic points you made. One was uh, the breaking up of binary distinctions uh, perfectly illustrated by this wonderful artwork you showed us about foreground and background and the ability uh, or hopefully developing the ability to see both at once and not in a hierarchical fashion. That was one point. Another point you made is about multi-directional causality uh, for which you mainly used linguistics um, and words and meanings and how they constitute themselves, each other, and over and over and over again. And then comes the net of Indra and the jewels, which is an infinite mirroring function. Are they all three on the same plane? Mm -hmm. Uh, firstly, I have to apologize. Um, this is not um, any close to the best talks that you must have heard at Einstein Forum. 
I never interact with academics. My only interaction is on email, and I interact most of the time with small students who have ideas here and there, buzzing around like bees in their mind. So being with children a lot of time made my mind also that way. So, and I don't have uh, an academic, uh, I'm not a part of an academic language game to get these ideas all together in a perfect fashion. I hope one day I will learn that uh, art, but I'm extremely sorry if it has confused you all. I tried my best in the 10 days to reconstruct the talk. Uh, so now coming to the first, um, uh, first point that you made uh, about the um, distinction between the uh, subject and object and the openness and the background and the foreground. Uh, so what I meant to say here was that um, um, things can be looked at uh, with reference to the, uh, so uh, of course Merleau-Ponty gives a whole uh, lot of explanation about the uh, perception and phenomenology of perception, but it's otherwise even known uh, to people like um, Husserl and other people that uh, things are open in the sense that uh, they don't have a very strict demarcated boundaries. And uh, when you try to question and pin down, even at the level of perceptions, what happens is that there is a perceptual unit of data. And then we have uh, a structure imposed onto it to make sense. And then we, we have the response function. Should it, should it, if it's a water, I should drink it. If it's a, a tiger, I should run away from it and so on and so forth. So what happens is that uh, this may have a survival benefit here, but uh, what the side effect here is that then the language and the words start to condense and become refied. So we think that the world is completely uh, stable, like this table, uh, and uh, uh, this is the only conception of, uh, of the way things are. And this can be metaphysically, of course, one can entertain all, all these sorts of ideas, but soteriologically, when we do that same with the notion of human being or what is called a self, this can lead to a more suffering because we then look at uh, people in, in our own image and we think they are the way they are and we cannot give them uh, a possibility of change even in our own mind. So um, jumping between this foreground and background, uh, um, people like um, Husserl, Heidegger, and, and the other uh, philosophers, they knew about it. I'm not sure if they have done it. For instance, um, once I was speaking to Susan, and um, I, I, as, as I told that um, in the beginning that I took a vow that I, I think every, oh, there are only few philosophers who actually inquire about things in philosophy that they inquire in heart. If we don't do that and we just study the world uh, as it is, as a ready-made object, what then happens is that our private lives and our private conceptions of the world go away. And what we get is uh, something called a fatty mind, like a fatty liver. Our mind keeps uh, gathering a lot of abstractions and conceptions, but our ways of living and being are completely different. And uh, then you have, uh, the result is you have people like Heidegger who said all these wonderful things about background and foreground and being, but at the same time said some of the most abhorring things about Jews. So I wonder why would that happen for a, for a person who studies so much about the metaphysical realm? Why, why, why can someone make such a boring comments? That is precisely because there is this duality. We think we can separate the mind and the brain. We can separate the thought, word, and the action. And um, there are some uh, philosophers who also said this might be the beginnings of the slavery movement that you can separate the thought, word, and action so that some people can do the thought and uh, word and put all the burden on the action on someone else who has to then carry on all this uh, process. Um, so these things exist all the time around us. And what I meant to say was that you can do this switch, uh, even, even if we uh, take the usage of the word meditation in the Cartesian sense, um, if you just closely investigate things, uh, the foreground and background keep switching. And you can carefully do that without losing any of, any of these things. Now, the second thing that you have uh, said about was about this um, 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 unidirectional and the multidirectional causality. So this can be again illustrated with the um, example of, for instance, the classic example that is given in the text uh, about the house and a rafter. So we think that when we have, when we take the rafter with us, we think it is being added to the house. But house is the rafter. There's nothing about, about it. House is also in the rafter. And 
if you remove the rafter away from the house and just keep it on the road, it uh, stops being a rafter. So what happens then is that if we take walls, bricks, rafter, and so on, these are not um, causing the house in a linear hierarchic, hi hierarchical fashion, though we may construct it that way, that you put the bricks first and the walls next and the rafter next. But when we have the complete notion of the house, at least on a, a semantic or a conceptual level, these things interfuse in such a way that simultaneously um, the rafter is causing the house, house is causing the rafter, a rafter is causing the walls, walls is ca are causing the uh, rafter and so on and so forth. But, but very interesting, once Wittgenstein made, made a clever remark here, he said, uh, commenting on the foundations of mathematics, he said, it's not as if um, the roof is supported by the walls, it's as if the walls are su supported by the roof. So this sort of inversion process. And this is definitely not uh, causally linear. We don't have one cause proceeding the other cause, though we can also study it uh, uh, when, we, when we analyze it in a linear fashion that has its own limitation. So this is the second thing. And the third thing about the net of Indra, um, um, these three things, are simultaneously one and the same. So the whole interpenetrates into the parts. So th this view is exactly psychedelic. Maybe some people who have tried um, psychedelics may have seen this view because when you change the brain chemistry, um, uh, things that make a sense, uh, uh, parts of the brain that make sense, they may not uh, completely function and then you can see this fusion together. So this uh, concept of reality shows that everything interpenetrates into everything else, even at the level of concepts. Our concepts need uh, other concepts. So what I gave uh, the example of the words, because it was simple, but that's the exact trees that you get when you represent a glass, for instance. You take a glass and you have glass uh, objects like the material of the glass and the other uh, attributes of the glass. And what is glass as a node is defined by these things. And then because glass is not this, it slowly starts to link with other things in, in, in this node. And then it starts to interpenetrate itself because in an absolute realm, all these things are connected. So the glass interpenetrates into the other things and other things interpenetrate into it. The whole also interpenetrates into the parts, parts also interpenetrate into the whole. So meaning and words are like whole and parts. So they interpenetrate into, into, into each other. And in real uh, life, maybe the notion of emptiness acts as a whole. So that interpenetrates into its parts and also parts interpenetrate into the whole. So all these things are happening right here and right now. But because of conceptual constructions, we don't see it. And maybe for good reasons, because then we may not make any sense. But um, when um, for uh, soteriological purposes, it's important that we tend to look at these things a little bit uh, more closely because as Carl Jung said that uh, these are the things that uh, once were construed as a part of our being, but now th there is this divide that is pushing them a little bit away. And this is leading to most of the disasters that we see around. Um, just thinking about this, uh, one quick thought. I mean, I, I also felt uh, like Martin at many points. I kept trying to make notes and I was having a hard time wrapping my head around what you're doing. Don't apologize for your lack of formal education. That's not what it's about. Um, what you're doing, it seems to me, is, um, I think I just understood something about what you were doing. Um, you, you mentioned the absolute realm. And as you know, I'm in most ways a Kantian. And it occurred to me that actually what you're, you're trying to get us to think in a way that we are not used to thinking, which is, and, and indeed, that Kant and many people following him say it's impossible for us to think. We don't get the absolute realm. We are constructed so that we have you know, categories, particularly category of causality, and that is how we think. So you're actually trying to push us into a realm 
that many people have thought is not uh, accessible to human beings. It may be accessible to some other beings that we don't understand, but it's not accessible to us. So I don't think that um, there's anything to do with, I, I, I think even if you go on in this path and you, um, you know, learn some academic jargon, and you know plenty of that academic jargon, that's not your problem. Um, you are trying to push us into, um, into a different space in the same way that I'm not sure that anybody really understands quantum theory, actually. I have tried to read, you know, a bit about quantum theory, and I never quite have the impression that anybody gets it, at least in terms that's explicable to those of us who think in normal causal terms, except they keep saying, well, it, you know, it undercuts all of our conceptions of causality. So that, I'm just throwing that out. But um, we have a question here from Wendy Doniger in Chicago. Hello, Wendy. Um, glad that you're listening. And I think she actually formulated my earlier question better than I did. Uh, Wendy writes, in response to Susan's query, I would ask whether the solitary walk in the forest does not work on a random mind, but only on a mind that, like yours, has been reading and thinking about these metaphysical issues for a long time. This is surely also entirely true of the drug experience. You can only experience, admittedly, in a new dimension, the thoughts that have been latent in your own mind for a while. You want to respond to Wendy first? Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, Wendy. Uh, it, it, I'm, I'm thankful that you listened to the talk. Um, um, what, what I can say here is that um, you're right, we need uh, certain background conceptions for, for us to experience this, but um, I only think that we need this to undo a lot of things that we have gathered so far. So um, in, in ancient times where people did not know, I, I mean, it's a question, was the brain or mind tabula rasa really? I, I don't think uh, that's the case. There's always a structure that existed. But um, in, the, in the beginning of the time where things were more interconnected, like maybe the tribal people and uh, uh, even now the tribal people of uh, various places in the world, I think um, for them, they may not even need uh, this sort of meditation because uh, for them, being in the world itself ref reflects this sort of interconnectedness. Uh, but since we have diversed from that view, of course, we have to uh, undo that by training ourselves in these meditative processes so that we uh, get to see the interconnectedness finally again, which is also the same with um, um, people who consume drugs. Mm, but but um, the, the, again, the difference, as I, as I mentioned, was that um, for drugs, actually, I think, um, again, this can go into the mind-body divide and neuroscience has a lot to say. Um, drugs actually change the structure of the brain in one way or the other, but I'm not sure exactly um, whether our thoughts change the brain chemistry. Definitely they do in a sense that uh, things wire uh, differently when people meditate, uh, their uh, different parts of the brain are connected to each other in a different way. Uh, but I, I think this effect is not exactly the same as uh, when people take drugs. Uh, so this might be more natural in a very loose uh, usage of the word natural. Uh, so I would prefer that. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, that um, answered the qu question. Does that answer your question, Wendy? I guess so. Do we have any other comments or questions? from the virtual or the physical audience. Are they connected, by the way? The virtual and the physical? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So if there are no other questions um, from the virtual participants, then I'd like to ask one more. I mean, I was thinking about it at the beginning, but I didn't want to ask too many at once. Um, what is the, I mean, I, um, I mean, what you presented to me, I mean, feels like um, a new attempt to make the case for monism, right? And um, this is sort of a long debate, you know, in philosophy of how you see the world on a metaphysical level, right? And what's, is there a particular reason now 
to make the case for monism. I mean, Susan just mentioned, mentioned that, you know, she's a, Kant, a Kantian. I mean, you know, that's sort of um, the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 main, the main case for, I mean, he basically makes the case for, to kind of have a moral conception of the world, you need to have some kind of dualism, right? Because you need to have a divide between the is and the odd. And um, I mean, it's great as a, as a concept. I mean, I'm, I think it's wonderful, but you know, obviously the world fails to live up to that <laughs> all the time. Um, and I was always worried that when you go to monism, the problem is, you know, whether it's Spinoza's version of it, um, or um, I mean, or, or Hegel's version of it. I mean, he also has a slight comment is that you, by, by negating those differences and, and bringing everything into one, you don't have any, you basically have to understand the world in a way so that it either feels all natural or all necessary, regardless of what happens. But when you have the is all distinction, right? You can make the case for why things should be different than they are. So is there a particular reason given maybe current world events or just general to kind of, to, I mean, ethically to think of the world monistically and not dualistically? Yes, I, I think in the, in, the, in the beginning, I was um, going to speak about the notion of emergence and holism and reductionism in the, in the previous talk. But then um, I thought there is no point to speak about the book. Uh, and then I changed the talk. And uh, what Susan told was, maybe I can speak something relevant to the present times. So I thought, okay, this is one of the aspect of the book because um, it also studies um, the, the connections between the holes and the parts. Uh, so I, I have said it, and I'm not an expert on Spinoza or Hegel or even Kahn, but um, monism, of, of course, it was there in India as well, uh, where it's anatman, the theory of anatman, that everything is one. Um, the difference between that and this, as much as I can see in my own limited understanding, is that everything is one, but uh, I don't think, I'm not sure if they would go to the extent of saying that one is also everything. So returning back to the world, that's a last stage. So uh, this emptiness, what it does is that it shows the views, but it also has to erase itself. So finally, one has to return to the world and the differences still exist. So one has to be the Janus uh, two-headed figure that one does see the differences and thereby um, making possible the cases for morality and so on. But also one have to have the eye towards uh, um, the interconnected uh, nature of things. But I'm not sure if art is about this interconnectedness. I'm not sure if philosophers have uh, um, thought about this has to be the art. But here, the differences still exist. The glass is, of course, different from me. But in another, in a deeper sense, it's not. Conventionally, we don't throw this away. As we have seen in the uh, theorem, uh, uh, inside the circle, differences still do exist. I mean, these two views are simultaneously existing together. Like for instance, I know Gur performs magical tricks. So he knows that it, it, it's a trick, but every time he has to perform, he also will know that um, there is, a, this has to be magic also in it. This is a paradox of magic. That it, it, it's, it's also the trick, but it's also magical, but it's also, is it one and, and the same time simultaneously, I'm not sure one has to have, like Gore has to have this distinction in his mind uh, to distinguish between it. But I'm not sure if the people in the, um, the, the monies, uh, I did not read much, but uh, I'm not sure if they go to the extent of saying that one is again in the parts and the parts are therefore also important. You cannot just abstract away the parts into this uh, singularity, which is this, uh, as I described the homogenization process where there's no differences and what we have is just the blob and we, we can make no sense of it. So you have to reconstruct the world and that's the final step. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give Wendy Donegan as our furthest guest, I think, uh, the last word, short and sweet. Thank you, that is a fine answer, she said. And I think we can all join in in thanking you, Sham for this mind-bending, provocative lecture.
but also for your very wonderful stay in Kaput, and we hope that you return uh, in one form or another as soon as you can. Thank you very much.